three rocket launches in under 19 hours, 83 orbital missions this year alone, shattering their own record of 68. China just pulled off something that has U.S. senators scrambling to draft emergency legislation. While NASA faces potential 24% budget cuts, Beijing is finalizing tests for their moon rocket's 2026 debut. But here's what nobody's talking about. How did China close a gap that once seemed impossible? What's really driving this acceleration, and why are American lawmakers suddenly treating this like a national emergency? The answer starts on December 8th, when China's launch teams executed something that reveals just how far their infrastructure has evolved. At 5.11 p.m. Eastern, a Long March 6A lifted off from Taiyuan carrying Guowang Constellation satellites. The launch team had conducted special cold weather reviews because winter temperatures in northern China drop brutally low and they'd added extra thermal protection to every critical component. Just five hours later, at 10.41 p.m., a Long March 4B roared out of Juquan in the Gobi Desert with the classified Yaogan 47 satellite fighting through severe cold and punishing winds. Then Tuesday morning, the TJSW-22 communication satellite launched from Xichang. What makes this significant goes beyond raw numbers. All three launches occurred on the same Beijing calendar day from three geographically separated sites using three different rocket variants. This demonstrates something American analysts have been quietly warning about. China has built redundant distributed launch infrastructure that can sustain high operational tempo even under brutal conditions. The China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation wasn't just celebrating a record. They were proving industrial capacity. SpaceX's previous record was three Falcon launches in 20 hours from essentially two sites using one rocket family. China matched that cadence across a vastly larger geographical area with multiple vehicle types, each requiring different ground systems and range coordination. What does that tell you about their workforce training, about their ability to scale operations when needed? The Long March family has now reached its 615th flight with a 97% success rate. They're approaching Falcon 9's 99.46% reliability while launching government payloads, commercial satellites, deep space missions, and crewed flights across a diverse vehicle lineup. SpaceX still dominates with 134 launches last year and targeting 178 this year. But here's the uncomfortable question. How long does that gap last if China maintains this accelerating pace? The Guo Wang Constellation launch reveals their strategic thinking. Over 100 operational satellites are already in orbit, with plans to scale to 13,000 satellites through China SatNet, the state-run operator. That puts them in direct competition with Starlink's 9,000 satellite network. But there's a crucial difference. Starlink must answer to shareholders and turn a profit. Guowang is a national infrastructure project backed by unlimited state resources. Which model wins when timelines stretch to decades? While launch numbers grab headlines, what's happening 400 kilometers overhead tells you where this is really going. On December 9th, astronauts Jiang Lu and Wu Feiyue conducted an eight-hour spacewalk to inspect damage on the Shenzhou 20 return capsule's window, likely caused by space debris. For 32-year-old Wu, this was his first spacewalk, making him China's youngest spacewalker. The technical execution here matters. Shenzhou 20's return module has no handrails, so Jiang rode Tiangong's robotic arm directly to the spacecraft, a procedure requiring precise coordination between the astronaut, the arm operator inside the station, and ground control. Think about what this represents operationally. China identified a critical problem, launched a rescue mission, conducted a complex spacewalk using robotic systems, and developed a repair plan, all while maintaining normal station operations. 
The Shenzhou 21 crew will stay on Tiangong for five more months, conducting experiments in life sciences, materials research, and combustion studies. This isn't aspirational anymore. This is routine space station operations, exactly what the U.S. does with ISS. Except ISS retires in 2030, and China's station could be the only operational platform in low Earth orbit, unless American commercial stations come online on schedule. That's why U.S. lawmakers are scrambling. Last month, a bipartisan Senate group, including former astronaut Mark Kelly, proposed creating a National Institute for Space Research, specifically to address the post-ISS era. Kelly flew to ISS four times during the shuttle era, so when he warns that Tiangong could become the main hub for international research if America doesn't prepare now, he's speaking from operational experience. But here's the uncomfortable reality. While senators propose legislation, NASA faces potential 24% budget cuts in 2026, with science funding taking the heaviest hit. China doesn't have that problem. Their space program answers to strategic national priorities, not annual appropriations battles. The Wolf Amendment prevents NASA from cooperating with China's space agency without special congressional permission. That restriction looked smart in 2011, but now it means the U.S. is locked out of potential collaboration on the only space station that will exist after 2030. China landed its Zhurong rover on Mars in 2021, months after NASA's perseverance. That wasn't just symbolic. It demonstrated integrated capability in robotics, sensors, AI, and advanced manufacturing, all critical technologies for economic competition here on Earth. And they're planning crude lunar landings by 2030, while NASA's Artemis program faces repeated delays and budget uncertainty. So, what's actually driving this acceleration? Start with human capital. More than 40% of Chinese university graduates earn STEM degrees, compared to roughly 20% in the United States. China is home to half of the world's top 20 science cities, according to the Nature Index, and the Dongbi Index now shows China has more high-level science and technology talent than America. This isn't temporary. This is generational investment producing sustained output. Then there's manufacturing dominance. China controls global supply chains for rare earth elements, materials essential for sensors, batteries, magnets, and satellites. When you control the raw materials, you control production costs and timelines. American companies can design superior technology, but if critical components come from Chinese-controlled supply chains, leverage shifts. Combine that talent pool and manufacturing base with centralized strategic planning, and you get programs like the Long March 10. On December 11th, the China Academy of Launch Vehicle Technology held a mobilization meeting for the 2026 crewed spaceflight mission. The Long March 10 supports China's goal of landing astronauts on the moon before 2030, and the specifications are formidable, 90 meters tall, 2,187 tons at liftoff, capable of delivering 70 tons to low Earth orbit and 27 tons toward the moon. China's lunar architecture requires two Long March 10 launches. One carries the Mengzhou crew spacecraft, the other carries the Lan Yu lunar lander. They rendezvous in lunar orbit before descent. China's Manned Space Engineering Office hinted in October that the first Long March 10 flight with Mengzhou is planned for 2026, and when Chinese officials announce a timeline, they typically deliver. They've already completed static fire tests, pad abort tests of Mengzhou, and takeoff landing tests of the Lan Yu lander. What caught analysts off guard was the recovery ship announcement on November 30th. China isn't copying SpaceX's landing leg approach. Instead, they've built a 144-meter ship named Linghang 
that uses a net-based capture system like aircraft carrier arresting cables. The rocket descends into a large net, and ground-based buffering systems absorb kinetic energy, eliminating heavy onboard shock absorbers and landing gear. This approach tolerates greater landing deviations than propulsive landing, and unlike legged systems where each rocket needs custom landing gear, the net works with different vehicle sizes while keeping designs simpler and lighter. Testing of robotic Lanyu prototypes is scheduled for 2027 and 2028, followed by uncrewed Mengzhou Lanyu missions in 2028 or 2029. The Mengzhou crew module can carry six astronauts, double Shenzhou's capacity. Lanyu will carry two astronauts to the lunar surface. Everything leads to China's crewed lunar landing in 2030. So what are we actually watching here? China is executing a methodical, heavily resourced space program with clear milestones, redundant capabilities, and strategic alignment across government, industry, and academia. Meanwhile, the U.S. is trying to maintain leadership through fragmented commercial partnerships, inconsistent political support, and budget constraints while locked out of cooperation with the only other nation currently operating a space station. The gap isn't closing by accident. It's closing because one side treats space as a national priority with unlimited patience, while the other treats it as a budget line item that changes every election cycle. So here's what this all means. In 2011, when the Wolf Amendment locked NASA out of cooperation with China, the assumption was that American technological superiority was so dominant that isolation would hurt China more than the United States. Fourteen years later, China operates the only space station that will exist after 2030. They're testing lunar landing systems for a 2030 crewed mission, and they're launching rockets at a pace that would have seemed impossible a decade ago. The question isn't whether China can reach the moon. The question is what happens when they get there first with a functioning lunar base while America is still trying to get Artemis off the ground. Because in 2019, China landed on the far side of the moon, something no other nation had done. In 2021, they put a rover on Mars on their first attempt. In 2024, they brought back samples from the lunar far side. Each milestone they hit doesn't just advance their program. It shifts global perception about who leads in space. And that matters because space leadership translates to terrestrial influence. Countries choosing technology partners, students deciding where to study, companies deciding where to invest. These decisions follow demonstrated capability, not historical reputation. When China completes their crude lunar landing in 2030, and America is still working through Artemis delays, what does that do to 50 years of assumed American space dominance? The gap is closing not because China got lucky, but because they made a national decision to treat space as a multi-generational priority with the resources to match. The real question is whether America is willing to make that same commitment or keep treating space as a discretionary budget item. What do you think? Can the U.S. close this gap before it's too late? Or are we watching a fundamental shift in space leadership? Drop your thoughts below. If this breakdown gave you a different perspective on what's really happening in space, hit that like button and share this with someone who still thinks America's space dominance is guaranteed. And subscribe to Atlas Space because this story is just getting started and you won't want to miss what happens next.